Good morning, everyone. This is Justin Ferry with KMJ Consulting. And on behalf of the I-95 Quarter Coalition, we'd like to welcome you to the RIDIS PDA Suite User Group webinar. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items quickly, and then we'll start the presentation. For audio, dial 719-867-1571 and enter 725-4375-POUND at the prompt. You may also listen through your computer audio. You'll be listening in to this webinar today, and I'll go over how to ask questions in the chat pod in a minute. If you have any technical issues, please call me at 484-557-7009. This webinar will be recorded, and presentations will be posted to the I-95 Quarter Coalition website. As attendees today are muted on the phone line, please ask your questions in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We'll be monitoring the chat box, and presenters will be uh, alerted of your questions, and they will answer them in due time. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Wells from the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Good morning, Kelly. How are you? Great. Good morning, Justin. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone joining us this morning on our user group meeting. Um, I have seen a lot of these presentations, and they are really exciting. And I think you'll enjoy all the different use cases that folks will be showing us today about how they've been able to use RIDIS and PDA Suite to answer some good um, traffic engineering, transportation-related questions. So with that, we will take a look at the folks. Sorry about that. We will take a look at the folks <laughs> that are here today. Go back one. There we go. We have um, about 50 organizations represented here this morning, and we have over 100 people registered. So um, it should be a really good audience full of people. And I was really interested to see that beyond the I-95 Corridor Coalition, we have people signed up from places like um, Missouri, in Michigan and Arizona um, and folks along the corridor as well. So I think it'll be a neat opportunity to share the good that we're doing, you know, across the U.S. So with that, this is our agenda for today. Um, our three spotlight presentations are shown there. One is about holiday travel forecasting in Georgia. And then um, two are sort of Maryland, D.C. area uh, projects where folks use RIDIS to look at performance in downtown Washington, D.C. for some different events, and then also one in Maryland to look at the U.S. 50 corridor. Then um, folks from the CAT Lab will come and talk to us about things that the working groups are undertaking, and also, um, as, as always, Michael Pack. will talk to us about what's coming and what's new in RIDIS. And then at the end, we'll ask for your input. So please be thinking about you know, those, those questions that you have. Um, I wish I could dot, dot, dot. Be thinking about that. And at the end, we'll come back and let you have a chance to share. So with that, I'll go ahead and go through the bios of all the speakers um, at this point. So our first speaker is Matt Glasser, and he's from Georgia DOT, and he is the Regional Traffic Operations Program Manager. They call it RTOP, and RTOP is a group of public and private sector engineers. They collaborate with all jurisdictions around Metro Atlanta to manage and optimize surface street signal timing and operations. Before being the RTOP manager, Matt worked in Georgia DOT's ITS group and oversaw the ITS maintenance program. He has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Georgia Tech, and he's a licensed professional engineer as well. So thank you, Matt, for joining us this morning. Secondly, we have Paul Silberman from Sabra and & Associates, and he has been active in the traffic engineering field for 22 years. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Maryland. He's a professional engineer and a professional traffic operations engineer, and he leads the transportation planning practice at Sabra and Associates in Maryland. He's also active in several community projects and professional organizations, including the Maryland Quality Initiative Engineering Outreach Program, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. Also from Sabra & Associates, we have Josh Colson, 
who is a traffic engineer with four years of experience. He's worked in transportation planning, traffic data collection, traffic analysis, traffic, excuse me, travel forecasting, traffic simulation, and traffic impact analysis. He's worked on projects all over Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and he's versed in numerous traffic analysis software projects, uh, excuse me, packages. He is a graduate, graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology with a bachelor's in civil engineering. And then our speakers from the University of Maryland, Mark France. Now, this is, listen up, this is really cool. You're going to hear things that we don't typically hear in transportation people's biographies, so this is pretty neat. Mark France earned a BA in physics and a BS in astronomy from the University of Florida and a master's from West Virginia University and a PhD in civil engineering, excuse me, civil and environmental engineering from the University of Maryland with an emphasis on transportation engineering. So I tell my 15-year-old my son all the time, you know, just get a degree. Just get a degree, and then you're really going to figure out what's cool. So I think it's neat to see someone who has such a varied background winding up in, in doing traffic. So that's really cool, Mark. Um, he is the lead transportation analyst at the CAT Lab at University of Maryland, where he develops and improves online transportation analysis tools and visualizations for public and private sector clients like those of us on the call today. And last but not least, our friend Michael Pack is the director of the CAT Lab at University of Maryland, where he makes transportation data more easily accessible and usable by those of us who do operations, planning, and research. He per previously has worked at the University of Virginia and also at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So with that, I'm going to do a quick um, coalition update for Denise. Um, the coalition's been busy, as it always is. Um, there's been several meetings lately. There was a big strategic planning session that many of us attended in uh, Philadelphia and a summit on traveler information strategies. There's also been a um, UAS and drone activities going on. There was a quarter coalition steering committee we uh, meeting a few weeks ago and also an intermodal freight webinar. Um, also, if you haven't, if you're just involved in VPP and RITIS, or excuse me, PDA and RITIS, um, I encourage you to check out the I-95 Corridor Coalition website. So you just Google I-95 Corridor Coalition and it pops right up. And um, there's really a lot of things going on in the coalition. So if this is your only um, connection to the coalition is coming to these user groups and webinars, I really encourage you to look at some of the other things that are going on in the coalition, maybe share them with your coworkers. There's just a wealth of things going on and, and we need to just get you know, maximum participation to get these things uh, spread out across our industry. So just a plug for the I-95 Corridor Coalition website. And with that, we will begin with our first um, presentation. My friend Matt Glasser is going to tell you about holiday travel forecasting in Georgia. Matt? Thanks, Kelly. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? He's good. Great. Uh, so, again, thank you guys for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Matt Glosser, and I'm the RTOP manager for GDOT. Uh, as Kelly said, RTOP is a multi-jurisdictional arterial traffic operations program. Uh, and that's meant to provide consistent, reliable, and secure travel throughout Metro Atlanta. And that's all done through proactive uh, traffic management operations uh, using existing and emerging uh, traffic systems, ITS technology, and overall approaches. Um, the short, non-technical version of that is to say that we do whatever it takes to make your commute better. Um, and with that charge, uh, you know, we started thinking outside the box and decided, well, I guess it was good to start uh, getting our communication folks involved. So here we go, trying to talk about holiday forecasting. To give you an idea of the scope of what we're looking at, this is a map of Metro Atlanta. and in that, you know, if you're familiar with Google uh, Google Earth, you can see the county borders behind that. That map is about 1,900 uh, traffic signals across 12 counties. That's 45 individual routes uh, with several grid systems. Um, and that requires the program to collect and analyze a pretty immense amount of data to make sure that we are providing good performance and uh, and, and overall accountability for our local agencies and our stakeholders. And so the way that we do that is kind of two parts. We, we ingest a ton of data from the vehicle probe uh, data suite that uh, has been developed by the CAT lab. We also use uh, automated traffic signal performance measures. 
and we ingest all that and put it into uh, a self-built website uh, that we call uh, our Mark site uh, after Iron Man. Um, and, and this is a, a quick and easy way for us to analyze our monthly, uh, our monthly metrics um, in, a, in a way that does not require us to do a bunch of field calculations and verifications. In addition to that, before every major holiday, we do these pretty dense holiday analysis reports. And they're, for, for each of the zones, they're about 10 pages long. They highlight areas of concern or, or lack thereof for the traffic engineers. And, and as I think that you probably imagine, these things are pretty dense. And they are not intended for a non-engineer to read. And you know, a graph like this, you guys I'm sure are familiar with, this comes directly from Redis. Um, and so what our engineers do is they come in, they take a look at you know, what the previous Thanksgiving in this case looked like and compare that to a typical a typical search day and figure out where when we need to be adjusting our traffic signal plans if we need to be pushing down uh, a higher cycle length plan or backing it off uh, you know in this case this case right here we actually run faster on this corridor on on the days leading up to Thanksgiving than we do typically and so in that case our engineers know, you know, I don't have to worry about this one. But again, you know, let's face it, no one outside of the, the folks that are traffic engineers are going to read those reports. Um, and, and if we were to hand that to our communications department, they'd probably just throw their hands up in the air and say, I have no idea what I'm reading right now. Um, so as Chris Hillier from Alabama DOT likes to say we did a little bit of R&D and ripped off and duplicated an effort that the CAT lab had developed uh, in addition, uh, I guess, for Ed Silk at Baltimore. And what they did was they basically created a holiday forecast that was very similar to a weather forecast. You know, they threw in some easy to understand colors and graphics and suddenly the message of the 10 page reports became a lot easier to understand. So let me go back to our map again. You know, we, we have these, we have these, you know, this big, this big large map, and it's across 12 counties, 1,900 signals. And if we were to try to do a one-size-fits-all approach for all of Atlanta, it basically just becomes noise, and it becomes unusable, and we may as well just say, well, traffic's going to be bad, which doesn't really help anyone at all. And they go, well, that's just Atlanta, so what's different? So to accommodate that, we went right back to those reports that had been developed by our engineers and used those to start generating the reports. And again, by looking at each one of those zones, you know, one, two, three, um, instead, of, instead of calling them zones one, two, and three, which again mean nothing to, uh, to local individuals and certainly the traveling public, you know, we went with the obvious answer, just call it Buckhead. Call it Northwest Atlanta. Call it South Atlanta. Call it East, you know, uh, East Wall. And what we came up with was kind of a, a quick block of this. And this is all those areas in, in one graphical view. And we were able to take that, push it together, and by quickly looking at this, you can kind of figure out what days are going to be good and what days are going to be bad. And, you know, just stole those colors right directly from, from Baltimore using a similar color coding system. And, and we'll take a closer look here. You know, this is a close-up view of, of what we said downtown was going to look like. And, and in there, you can see that we highlighted specific areas that we told drivers to avoid, or maybe times that they should consider traveling. And all this, you know, what we did was you know, since we had this in the picture, it was easy to tweet out. So, uh, again, you know, that was all done from an analysis that, that we had already done. It, it didn't require any additional work. It just basically required us to take our engineering language and make it English. And so part of that is done through the trend analysis tool that I, 
that I'm again I imagine you guys are familiar with. And in that case, you know, we just highlighted sections of the map and started comparing them. And it's just a you know a very quick visual way of of identifying where we're going to have problematic areas that we can focus in on them. Uh, and again, with that, you know, you know, as as it'll say, you know, a picture says a thousand words, and we could have tried to explain to people how bad traffic was going to be, but instead we used the tools that were available to us and used the, the GIF creation to basically do a map of what Atlanta was going to look like at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday right before Thanksgiving. And we took that and tweeted it out and, you know, to give people an idea of what they were up against if they were going to try to leave work right after lunch. Um, and again, that was that was a message that we kind of hit home. It's like, if you think that you're going to outsmart everyone by leaving at lunch, you're about one out of, you know, one people. Everyone's thinking about doing that. So now it comes down to figuring out how do we, how do we get this information out. Um, you know, it's not going to do us any good if we're just circulating it amongst our peers through ITS Georgia, through Georgia ITE, you know, the, the average public isn't going to look at that. So on Monday morning uh, before Thanksgiving, our communications office gave an advanced copy to several of uh, several of our news outlets. And within a few hours, we had interviews scheduled for that inter uh, for that afternoon. And by the time we were treating, tweeting out our forecast the following morning, the news outlets were running the story, and we were getting more requests for interviews. You know that that Tuesday. Um, you know, I would say at the end of the day, you know, this was this was a huge success for us. It was a great opportunity to remind the public of the work that we do uh, every day and how seriously we take it. It highlighted our capabilities and shocked uh, our local news outlets that we were capable of doing this. And by the time we got back from Thanksgiving holiday, we were already getting requests to do forecasts uh, for <laughs> for every holiday. And eventually the Super Bowl, which, you know, that was impossible to do. But, uh, you, know, you know, doing this for floating holidays, you know, we will say is a lot more difficult. And we're definitely going to do this again. Um, Thanksgiving was a nice way to start this off because Thanksgiving is always the same day, you know, this, uh, every year. Um, but it's, it's provided us an opportunity and something to look forward to uh, moving forward. Um, so I have some time for questions. I don't see any pop up in the chat chat bar, but I'm uh, happy to take them if you have any. All right, I see Michael Pack typing a question. So let's see what that is. Anyone else? Uh, feel free to type your questions into the chat box for Matt. I love that you said um, that you kind of used what Baltimore did, right? Because we all saw the presentation of a few uh, meetings ago where Baltimore did the, the very same thing. So I love that you just used that. And I really like the way you displayed it in that chart where it wasn't so technical. It was just sort of, here's the location, here's the day. And uh, the part about tweeting it out, I hadn't thought. We put ours on our website, but I had never thought about tweeting it out. That's a great um, way to get the word out. Yeah, you know, okay. and... and I will say uh, kudos to, to Michael Pack and Baltimore. The thing is, they they made this very easy for us. You know, they have a lot of templates kind of hidden behind the scenes, um, and it looks like Michael's uh, putting them out. You know, we you know it meant that we didn't have to re recreate the wheel. Um, and so, if there's for any of the other DOTs that are on the line, I would certainly say that before you go about trying to message something, I would reach out to Michael Pack because they have a lot of uh, a lot of things up their sleeves. Yeah, that's great. And also, you know, people will get used to seeing this information presented in a certain way up and down the corridor. So it's sort of like a little, you know, NUTCD of <laughs> traveler information. Very cool. All right. Christian writes, have you had to deal with skeptical members of the public? When we did this, we got some responses like, why do I need this when I can use Google Maps? Some seems to be a disconnect with the public sometimes. So, Christian, tell us where you're from as um, Matt answers the question. Um, you know, uh, I think what, what's been nice for us has been the way that our communications department has engaged the local media. 
Um, they really try to get ahead to try to make make stories positive and tell the good things that are going on. Um, you know, yeah, there's always kind of skeptical members of the public, and you know that as, as you always kind of say, it's like you know, if you have your driver's license, you're a professional traffic engineer, right? Um, you know, I think it's just the at the end of the day, we're just trying to focus on the positives and the things that we can do, and reminding folks that that their tax dollars are being spent in an appropriate way, that that we're trying everything that we have um, in our arsenal to make their their commute safer and easier every single day. And that's the message that we try to keep hitting every single day with them. Um, you know, when they bring up Google Maps, you know, we say that, you know, Google Maps is a great tool and you should be using it. Uh, and that's an, easy, that's an easily understood mechanism for you. Uh, and certainly don't want to discourage it. We have these tools that have a finer granularity that have some extra data hidden behind it that you don't get to see. And that gets us, uh, that gives us the ability to, to figure out what might be coming uh, in a mathematical and engineering way as opposed to just kind of guessing. Very good. Good answer. All right. Any last questions for um, Matt? All right. We'll see if Michael Pack has one last thought about this relevant. Um, but yeah, we would definitely use your template. Why start from scratch, right? So my goal is to make a note for myself in my October reminder where I try to start thinking about this to say, hey, don't forget that there are these templates on the I-95 quarter or on in Redis that I can use to do this work. And you know, we can move on, and I can just if people have questions, I can just kind of answer them in the chat. Uh, chat box, that's easier for folks. Perfect, that sounds great. Thanks, Matt. All right, and so, oops. is this yours? Yeah, that is. That was one extra one that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, so again, stealing from, from Michael, they had created a template for doing before and after studies, again, to make things a little bit easier to digest. And we took that and handed it to our communications office and um, you know, folks that, that make things look pretty. And so they took our before after studies that are about 20 pages long for corridors and condensed it down to one picture. And again, that's something that we just tweet out when we're done with the project. So that's something that we want to share with you guys. Um, I believe I also provided that template to Michael, so they, uh, they may be able to share that as well. Very good, all right, Michael, if you can address that in the chat box, that'd be great. And oops, excuse me. And we will go ahead on to sorry, I just lost my screen for one second. Okay, we will go on to um, Paul Silberman from DC or uh, from Sabra and Associates who's doing work for the District of Columbia DOT and he'll share some opportunities to measure performance in downtown Washington DC. Paul. Thank you. Good morning everybody. We're going to talk about uh, how um, the um, RIDIS um, PDA suite was used in a more urban setting um, for uh, both signal timing um, analysis optimization as well as uh, special event uh, traffic management. Um, next slide. Oh, I'll do it. All right, let me get my mouse. Okay, so. Um, the overview of the uh, presentation will just give you a little bit of the background, what the motivation was for doing this type of analysis using these tools. Uh, when we downloaded the agency's data, um, the different sources in addition to the PDA suite, uh, so the practical applications that we found, uh, future opportunities, and then um, open it up to some questions. So uh, the background is uh, about um, uh, five years or so ago, uh, we embarked on a, a citywide signal timing optimization effort. Um, hadn't been done in a couple decades, and uh, there's about 1,600 traffic signals in the District of Columbia. Um, so how do we evaluate uh, the benefits for all roadway users? This is an urban multimodal environment um, and uh, a lot of different corridors, area types downtown business districts, uh, arterial corridors, but also special events, um, how to predict, mitigate, and monitor um, 
much like Atlanta, D.C., metro area is very congested uh, area. I'm sure you guys have heard in the news that even the slightest closure of a major Potomac River crossing can have a, a, an effect for hours, if, if not even a day. So um, event management, um, incident management becomes, becomes quite a big deal. Um, so the motivation is we wanted to work with the RATIS data, uh, use the PDA suite and download the agency's data um, about the travel times and speeds. And um, just this presentation will focus on how we applied on this project, what we learned as we applied it, and uh, future uses. And I, I think you can kind of see uh, those black dots on that map represent sort of uh, the main study corridors for, for uh, the initial phases of the, of the signal timing optimization. Most of the downtown core business district and the National Mall and then some uh, arterial corridors, uh, primarily commuter corridors from Maryland. So uh, we used uh, the RITIS data set um, for both uh, the historical data um, as well as uh, live system status during special events. We also used AVL data from the uh, Regional Transit Agency, WMATA. We did also use a little bit of Google traffic, both live traffic and Waze. We also did some on-the-street floating car GPS measurements. Uh, we even did some uh, bicycle travel time conditions um, on select corridors where there's a um, dedicated bicycle facility, and we use CCTV during special events. So for the downtown optimization, this is about uh, a third of the district's traffic signals, 600-plus uh, uh, intersections. It was all implemented in one overnight. Um, I believe it was most, mostly done in one overnight, so um, it affected uh, cars, buses, pads, and bikes. And, you know, we had 49 different travel time routes that we were studying, 40 different bus routes. Um, there were 1,500 signalized crosswalks and 7,000 bike trips on, on the bike lanes that were impacted. So there were a lot of users impacted, and we wanted to see um, – you know, how we could use some of the, the big data available from RITIS and the PDA suite to help tell the story. Um, so, for example, in the 12th Street corridor between Pennsylvania Avenue, Massachusetts Avenue, this was a major commuter corridor. And so we looked at some before and after comparisons uh, after the new signal timing plans were on the street. And as you can see, that the um, green colors uh, represent the after period, and both during the a.m., midday, and p.m., they were all um, travel time improvements um, in those corridors. So that, that showed a benefit um, at that corridor level. When we looked at it um, another way uh, along the same corridor, 12th Street, um, just looking at um, sort of the spatial illustration of congestion based on the speeds, you can see that um, the amount of slow traffic in both duration and um, length um, significantly was reduced. And the speeds went up in those same time periods on the right um, during the after observations, uh, the a.m., midday, and p.m. peak hours. Um, so we did do some uh, benefit cost analysis for this. We aggregated the performance data and the user value of time and the you know related congestion costs and and for another uh, radial arterial corridor U U.S. Route One, which is Rhode Island Avenue um, in the northeast uh, sector uh, quadrant of the district, uh, we were able to show um, a savings in user delay from about forty almost forty two thousand down to thirty two thousand, so about ten thousand, which would uh, annualize to over two and a half million and user benefits. So it was a very successful uh, signal timing optimization in, in that corridor. Um, so switching gears now to special events, a uh, major special event that, uh, that was unique um, in this region was the, the Papal visit um, a few years ago. And so uh, DDOT was charged with a lot of special event planning to look at the 
traffic analysis of potential impacts, the road closures, development and mitigation measures. We had uh, alternative signal timing plans ready to be uh, deployed on arterials, and then monitor the, in real time uh, the traffic uh, conditions. And as you can see from this map, a large swath of the downtown area, the National Mall and the Central Business District was going to be closed off for that day. It was a typical weekday. Um, so what we did was we set up both uh, CCTV locations as well as on-street traffic observations, um, staff, you know, out at specific intersections to see how traffic demand was that day, how people were following posted detour routes, and if any changes to signal operations needed to be made on the fly. And um, what we found was as we uh, compared um, sort of a um, typical um, weekday to the um, day of the Pope visit, um, people really heeded the message to stay out of downtown, shift their work schedules or telework or um, work it, uh, take the day we off. We keep losing your audio. Oh, hello. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. We lost about 20 seconds, maybe. Oh, so I was saying uh, that when we looked at the um, RITIS comparison of the week of uh, September 23rd and uh, the previous week, a typical morning rush, you can see that the, um, the, the people heeded the message about the detour routes or shifting modes or staying home or telecommuting and actually congestion was very light so we didn't have to implement a lot of the emergency signal timing plans, special incident management, um, point control, um, but it was it was very powerful to see this not just um, at the level of you know downtown DC and the immediate streets but at a region-wide level it really showed that um, the impact that the special event planning, the success of it had uh, on that day. Um, so what are some of the uh, uh, future steps for uh, us in using RITIS and the PDA suite on these types of projects? Um, we do feel very comfortable using the PDA suite for travel time data analysis, essentially mining um, the before and after speeds and travel times and corridors that were used for signal timing. Um, and you know, we can still do the field data collection for some validation and immediate results, but um, the, the PDA suite was very helpful. We, we did have to use um, a lot more AVL data than expected um, to really get the transit benefits. Um, that was sort of a, um, a, a high uh, level of interest from DDOT and the regional transit agency to see if the signal timing helped the buses. Um, you know, we, we tried to leverage the available uh, trip data from the bike share system to see, you know, if there was any difference in, in some of their speeds and uh, OD uh, pairings, but uh, we weren't able to get very much on pedestrians and we're still looking for, um, you know, maybe some crowdsourced or, or GPS data, but definitely for vehicles and buses, we, we had a lot of success with the, the big data. Um, and I think that's... Uh, Everything I wanted to cover about that project, so I'll I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Paul. If anyone has any questions, please type them out in the chat box. Sorry about that, I was muted. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, any questions, please pop them into the chat box. I was saying how, to myself, apparently, how it's, it's sort of neat sometimes when we tell the public, unlike our earlier conversation about telling the public uh, and them not listening or them complaining, it's interesting sometimes when they actually do listen and we are underwhelmed by the traffic impact. That's always a, a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay, and we have a comment from 
Mr. Sivasilium, asking you to present this at the MW COGS committee. So it sounds like he will call you and this will get even further yep. play. Great. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, if you have any other questions for um, Paul, please type them into the chat box. And with that, we will go ahead and get to our next presentation, which is um, by Josh Colson, who is also from Sabra and Associates doing work for Maryland SHA. And he's going to tell us about US-50 and the work he's done on that corridor. Josh? All right. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, this presentation is going to cover the RITIS applications that we used for the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration's US-50 study, uh, which we worked on this past fall. So I'm going to cover uh, the project's background, some challenges that we faced, uh, how we use the data available on RITIS to overcome those challenges and choose a typical day. And finally, I'll show you the results from our calibrated model. Um, so just a brief uh, background and to set up the stage here, um, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge um, sort of creates a natural bottleneck um, between the mainland of Maryland and the eastern shore in Delaware. Um, this is the US-50 study corridor in green. Um, so with the beach traffic in the summer, um, basically this draws a lot of seasonal traffic. Uh, our study focused on the westbound congestion, which peaks during Sundays during the summer months as vacationers head home from the beach. Um, you can kind of get a sense here of the limited number of alternative routes to use. Um, people can either travel about 50 miles to the north and go around the bay or 150 miles to the south to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. So there, there are really limited options. Um, and so we, we definitely see a lot of traffic with the bottleneck that the bridge creates. Um, so again, our study focused on the westbound um, congestion on US-50, which peaks on um, Sundays during the summer. We had about a six-hour peak period um, between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, the study limits were from the Maryland 404 uh, inter intersection on the eastern shore in Y Mills and the Severn River, which is near Annapolis. Uh, the purpose of the project was to code and calibrate an existing conditions VISTA model to be used for future alternative analysis aimed at mitigating congestion. Um, for those who don't know, VISTIM is a really powerful microscopic traffic simulation software tool which was chosen for its ability to handle complex interchange configurations on freeway facilities as well as multiple uh, multi-hour simulations. So some challenges that we faced were um, the impact of traffic incidents on our data. Uh, the study covered a large area uh, congested with drivers who are mostly unfamiliar, um, and it was a six-hour time frame, which meant that traffic incidents were common. Uh, these incidents created temporary bottlenecks, which impact speeds and vehicle throughput both upstream and downstream of the incident, inducing diversions on the parallel route. All of this combined to make identifying and sort of quantifying the typical traffic conditions um, to serve as a calibration target for our VISTA model very difficult. Uh, we would typically, you know, if it was a, a typical corridor study, we would average several months' worth of data and any atypical traffic uh, during that time due to incidents or, or weather or not would, would be averaged out and it wouldn't really impact our calibration. But here we didn't really have the, that luxury because um, of the limited data set, you know, there were only so many Sundays during a, a given summer that were non-holiday. And so we really wanted to be careful with the data that we were using so that we didn't run into issues during our calibration process. So we used RITIS to help um, sort of find a typical day to serve as that target. And uh, the incident information on RITIS, which is provided by Maryland DOT's Coordinated Highway Action Response Team, or CHART, was critical in understanding where and how particular incidents and the resulting congestion impacted the corridor and our data. Uh, on the right here, you can see the type of information that gets displayed for each of those incidents. Um, it gives us location, duration, any lane closures, and then we can see the inner speed profiles upstream and downstream um, of that incident. So for each of the Sundays during the summer, we compiled the interic speed data, and then we noted um, 
the count data that was collected on that day for our project and then any major traffic incidents so we can sort of begin to paint a picture of the data that we were dealing with. Um, we combined all of that side by side and sort of did a visual inspection. Um, we can notice a lot of variability due to the incidents and the speed data and no day was completely incident free. Um, based on the visual inspection, we hypothesized that, you know, July 15th seemed to be, seemed to have the least disruptive incident data. Um, but we also are aware that, you know, the speeds don't tell the whole story. Uh, we also needed to look at traffic volumes to make sure that um, the demands were typical on that day as well. And we also wanted to develop some sort of uh, quantifiable way to objectively justify uh, any decisions that we made. So we developed a process uh, where we divided the corridor into five segments of equal length uh, for the evaluation of the Interx travel time data, and then we chose five locations with University of Maryland traffic count sensors uh, to evaluate the traffic volumes on each day. Uh, we then calculated the mean and standard deviation of each location and for each hour. Uh, and then we developed a point system where we awarded one point for um, a data point within one standard deviation and two points for a data point that was within half a standard deviation of the mean, summed up those, look, uh, summed up those points at the five locations, um, and then you know, saw where the days ranked. Uh, and then as you can see on the right with the red circles, uh, that July 15th day, which we had previously hypothesized as the best day, um, did pass the, the test here. Uh, with the most points in both uh, travel time and uh, in terms of traffic volumes for that day. It was most typical. And so that's the day that we used to sort of compare our calibrated model to and, and to shoot for when we were in the calibration process. Um, here you can see the results from that calibration effort. Uh, the Enrix data is on the left, and then I'm showing the Vistim uncalibrated speeds in the upper right quadrant and then the calibrated speeds in the bottom right quadrant. Um, overall, we were able to get 95% of our segments um, and hours within 10 miles per hour of the interest reported travel speeds, which was the target that was set for us by the Maryland DOT State Highway Administration for this particular project. Do I have any questions? Okay, great. Um, I haven't seen any. Any questions for Josh? There's been an interesting uh, conversation in the chat box when you mentioned pedestrian detection. There were some questions about pedestrian detection, and Matt Glasser chimed in with some information. So if that's an area of interest to you, go ahead and read the, the information in the chat pod. Anyone else for Josh? All right. So if anyone has a question, feel free as it crosses your mind to type it in, and I know Josh will be watching for those. But at this point, we will go ahead. Thank you, Josh, for your presentation. Yes, thank you. We will go ahead. Yeah, we will go ahead and um, get a look at some things going on at the Cat Lab, who, if you don't know, are the sort of keepers and the um, developers of the RIDIS and the PDA Suite software. So first, we'll hear from Mark France, and he will give us some updates on what the working groups have been up to. Mark. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Can everyone hear me okay? You sound good. Great. Um, yeah, so we uh, have created three new working groups um, to help us vet out and prioritize some uh, improvements to uh, tools that we're developing. Um, so, next slide. So we're, we're the three working groups um, that have had their initial kickoff meetings uh, back in February. Um, are focused on OD and trajectory analytics, which met on February 13th, our signal performance measures group, which met on the 26th of February, and then our enhanced work zone analytics group, which work, uh, met on the 28th of February. Um, so we had participants from uh, several different agencies in each of these groups, um, representing state DOTs, MPOs, uh, federal agencies, um, other city representatives, consultants working for those DOTs, and of course, academia, including the Texas Transportation Institute, as well as CAT Lab. Um, following each of these meetings, uh, we had a poll for the, the participants to give us their input and feedback on what the highest priorities were um, for either improving or developing 
uh, the various tools that were discussed in each of the meetings. Um, so just real quick, I don't want to provide too much detail um, for, the, for the general group, but for the trajectory analytics, we're going to be working on um, raw data downloads, um, uploading of agency-specific shapefiles that define geometries that they want for OD analysis, um, and also providing travel time statistics from the trajectory data for an entire trip rather than just segment by segment. So that's all interesting stuff that we're um, working on vetting out internally here at CAT Lab to figure out the scope and time to deliver those requests. Um, for the intersect or the uh, signalized performance measures, we're looking at developing some um, tools to look at turning movement delay and turning movement volumes, as well as queue lengths at uh, intersections using both XD data as well as the trajectory data. And then finally, the, the work zone, enhanced work zone analytics group uh, is an existing tool that we have in Redis that maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, just working on improving the functionality uh, and upgrading some of the um, analytics that we have in that tool. The highest priority thing that we're pursuing there is uh, giving people the ability to filter for the work zones within their specific geographic region that they're interested in, and then allowing the users to define um, dynamically what congestion is for each of those work zones based on travel times and speed limits from the probe data. Um, so we're, we're compiling all of these uh, feedback that we got from the groups and working with our art and development teams here at Cat Lab to um, pursue these recommendations from the working groups. And um, I'll be reaching out probably within the next two weeks to these groups to schedule the follow-up meeting um, to show some of the, uh, the ideas and progress that we've made based on those recommendations. So that's about all that I have. Um, happy to take any questions or comments in the chat box as we, um, I, I think I'm turning it over to Michael Pack now. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mark. If you have any questions for Mark, um, go ahead and pop it into the chat box. It looks like there's really cool stuff going on. That OD stuff is exciting, and every, you know, probably once a week someone says to me, oh, this speed data is great, but what else can we use it for? So I always tell them that this, to me, is the most exciting thing that we're starting to do, just that next level of you know, getting even more information out of that probe data. So that's really exciting. So not seeing any other questions, we will go ahead and I believe Michael is next. Michael, would you like to share with us what's new and coming with the British MPDA? Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. So, um, you know, some of what's new and what's coming is what Mark just uh, just discussed in those working groups. We've been uh, meeting with different different DOTs to talk about their potential use cases and what could and should be built into those tools moving forward. And we're currently working on building some uh, design documents around some of those discussions to, to go back to the group and continue the brainstorming. Uh, but some things have been deployed recently. Uh, during the last user group meeting, we gave a, a demo of the Everyday Counts Traffic Incident Management Performance Measures tool. Um, that is now live, and we'd encourage everyone to go to the website and check it out. Uh, it can be found under the Archive tab within the, the RIDIS website. And this allows you to go in and look at your agency's ATMS reported crash and disabled and you know, other type of event data and uh, view that in a, uh, a table but then also look at other types of reports that would tell you things like um, uh, you know, how many collisions or disabled vehicles are being cleared within 30 minutes versus an hour versus two hours. So you've got your incident clearance time and your roadway clearance time performance measures that are uh, represented in this. But you, there's other graphs that you can look at for um, uh, how many events you're having by day of week, by time of day, that sort of stuff. And this is also a great place to go in and help you to do after action reviews. You can uh, bring up the incident timelines uh, from this table. You can also do heat maps and other types of mapping applications for, for where your incidents are occurring within your agency. So go check that out. That's all uh, available right now. 
other recent deployments. Uh, we just finished up uh, adding the XD data functionality uh, from Enrix into the trend maps. So now you're able to go in and, and do finer granularity trend maps for your neck of the woods, uh, assuming your agency is, is purchasing the XD data uh, from Enrix and we're ingesting that for you. And I just have a little picture up here that shows a particular road in um, uh, Pennsylvania. On the right-hand side of the screen, those are your regular TMC segments uh, along this particular route. And over on the left-hand side, you can see the XD segments, uh, the different colors. Those are uh, finer granular data, so you, you get more insights into queue buildups and, and other types of measurements. Uh, so that's available. Go check it out. Um, I know that data is available in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Maryland and Virginia are getting ready to, to deploy XD data as well. <clears throat> Other recent deployments, um, the Region Explorer, for those of you who use that, uh, we, had, we had finished the flash conversion of that many months ago, but we've done some additional work to go in and just make the tool more performant. So much, much, much faster rendering of, of maps and tiles and being able to look back functionality and whatnot. Uh, we've also got a new bottleneck ranking comparison widget that has been deployed and should be available to everyone. And this uh, this tool is really cool in that you can look at like the top 10 type, top 20, whatever bottlenecks in a particular region in your state this month compared to the prior month compared to the month before that and how that's been changing over time. Uh, this tool has been available for a little while now, but now it makes use of caching, which makes all of the results for this comeback much, much, much quicker. So you're going to see a, a general theme here in these updates are making everything more performant and uh, more, more user friendly as you're moving through. Uh, same thing with travel time comparison and travel time delta ranking tools. These are the two tools that PennDOT funded uh, uh, at the end of last year. Both of these are for looking at arterial performance measures on signalized corridors. Um, we've added some new video tutorials to both of these tools so that you can go in and figure out how to use them if, you, if you've never used them before. Uh, we've made other types of improvements to these. Some of them are visual improvements. Uh, some of them are uh, actual calculation improvements that make the results more accurate, more statistically uh, valid. But these are really cool tools. And if you haven't checked them out, please go in and, and take a look at them. They're deployed in the Pennsylvania region right now. We've also done some additional enhancements for road searches. Uh, road searching is generally complicated, right? There's so many different ways of representing roads in the TMC segments and the XD segments and figuring out where the beginning of a road is and the ending of the road is, uh, what the mileage is on those roadways. And we've, we've spent a lot of time recently going in and trying to clean some of that up. It's a very complicated process. But, but trying to make that easier to do. And we, we've also updated the uh, XD road classes uh, to match some of the, uh, the newer map updates that are coming from the, the data providers. With the dashboards, we've done some work on the Map 21 map widget, and we've restored some abilities that we've uh, accidentally took out when we were doing some, some upgrades a few months ago and fix some other issues with the ranked bottleneck comparison um, uh, uh, widgets as well. Then the massive data downloader issue. Again, we've, we've fixed a lot of little bugs that might cause some of your downloads to kind of get stuck in a pending state, and that can be really annoying because then you have to write to support and ask them to, to unstuck it, <laughs> if, that's a, if that's a phrase, uh, for you. And um, with the trend maps, uh, we've, we've fixed some issues where um, uh, events might not have been displayed for the right time period within those trend maps if you're looking at a single date. Same thing with performance summaries and region ex uh, explore, just fixing 
little little tiny bugs here and there to to make these tools more more performant for you. So those those are the big bug fixes and new features that we've been uh, working on and have deployed since the last meeting. We've got other things in the works. The everyday counts traffic incident management performance measures that I told you was deployed earlier. There's still some additional graphs that we're working to add to uh, to those performance measures tools to allow you to look a little bit deeper into when and where incidents are occurring on your roadways. There's also a new mapping feature that we want to add. It's going to change the way some of the heat maps are drawn so that they're um, you can have spatial consistency at different zoom levels. Um, that's not necessarily a problem, but it's a new feature that we're building in. And, uh, we'll, we'll show you that during the next uh, quarterly meeting. I think you'll be excited about that. The other thing we're working on is in the incident logs, in the traffic incident management uh, performance measures tool, we're going to add the ability for you all to upload after action review documents to those incident reports. So uh, we've got a lot of agencies that, that put together some really nice after action review documents, and, and we want to make it easier for them to share those and associate them with the event so that they're always available. So right now, you can upload media files to the different events. And those media files can be pictures, it can be videos, news reports, links, you know, whatever. But these after action document loading will allow you to put up PowerPoint files and PDFs and all sorts of other stuff um, to have a, a really nice uh, review of how the incident was managed. So look for that coming out uh, relatively soon. We are still working through the bottleneck ranking modernization. So that's getting the last of the probe data analytics tools off of the Flash platform. So we're looking to complete this next month. And then we'll be free of Flash, but it's making good progress, and uh, most of the features have already been already been migrated. Next, we'll be moving on to the detector analytics. So for those of you who are still providing us with your sensor data, like your inductive loop detectors, your side-fired microwave or RTMS detectors, we're working on modernizing uh, that tool set as well. Uh, so that it won't be dependent on Flash and it will be more performant. And then there's a couple of new dashboard widgets that we're working on for the Maryland State Highway Administration that will also be made available to you all. One of them deals with roadway reliability and how that is changing from month to month over time. And then there's a, another one that is going to allow you to look at incidents and event comparisons and you know, how many events or incidents is your agency dealing with this month compared to uh, the prior month, or this, this year to date compared to the prior year to date. So those will all be uh, developed over the next few months. And then last but not least, the MAP21, uh, the PM3 reports are coming due sometime in June. Um, you know, we're not making any significant changes to the MAP21 reports, because we want those to be stable for the next reporting cycle. but we are building in some enhancements to make it easier for you to uh, run MAP21 reports on non-NHS segments to be able to analyze, uh, you know, the same type of performance reporting for, for other types of roadways in your state. That's a request you've been getting from a, a lot of different agencies and uh, MPOs. So look for that coming out before too long as well. Uh, an update on the volume data. Um, let's see, how, we, how is this going to work here? Just jumping through the slides. Oh, didn't quite work. All right, so this is our second attempt to show this slide, and we are still failing here. <laughs> but the point of this slide is to explain that as time has progressed, uh, the number of TMC segments that have been provided by the agencies has been increasing. So every every uh, six months or so, uh, the, the data providers add TMC segments to our roads. And what happens is uh, the number then of TMC segments that have volume data associated with them has been decreasing because a lot of agencies haven't been updating 
their volume data uh, with us. So um, it's just it's just getting a little bit worse and worse. So this is getting represented in a couple ways. One is some people, um, uh, when they be running their user delay cost reports, they're seeing a decrease in user delay cost over time. Well, you know that may be artificial if your agency isn't providing us updated volume data, because then you're having fewer and fewer segments that have those those volume data associated with it. So we're trying to do a, a conservative information campaign to let agencies know that they need to work with us to get those volumes updated. Please send an email to support, um, and we will we will work with you. I know Virginia and Maryland and Michigan have been doing a pretty good job of getting their their volume updated. The other states not so much. So let's uh, let's start a dialogue. Let's try to get your volume updated as soon as possible. And again, just send an email to uh, support at ridus.org, and we'll we'll get you going. And at this point, uh, this is where we uh, we ask you all to, to help us out. Uh, all of the features and functionality that are in um, in these tools are driven by you all, the users. Um, you're always welcome to join these user groups and the working groups and our listening sessions. Um, we need you to voice your opinions, type out your comments, let us know what is working for you, what is not working for you, and what features you wish we had in the system that we don't have today. If you don't tell us what you don't like or what you need, the tools aren't going to change. Um, so, so speak up, be vocal. We have relatively thick skin here, so let us let us know what's what's going on. And please start start typing in the chat box. And this is the time when we just kind of open up the lines and we we let people let us know what it is you're thinking about, what you, what you need. Also, if you have a nice use case, something that you're doing with the data, the tools, or with Redis and you'd like to share that with folks, please let us know, and we will, um, we will work with you to get you lined up for a, a speaking engagement with us in one of these next, uh, next sessions. So now I'm going to go silent, and we'll just wait for people to, to type in. All right, Michael, our first uh, person to chime in is Jesse, and he asked if the tool lets the users know if their volumes are updated or not, and if you could put a little, maybe a little reminder, hey, we don't have all your volume, would that be a possibility? That is a great suggestion and something we're working on for next month. So there's going to be a warning that comes up that lets you know that we might need some some new volume data. And then after you run a user delay cost report, uh, at the bottom of the user delay cost report, there's a little kind of a note section that tells you what what parameters were used in your query. As part of that note section, there will be a little message that pops up that tells you you know, of the 1,000 TMCs that you selected for your query, uh, 50 of them don't have volume data. And here's what those 50 are. And you can click on it, and it will save those 50 as a TMC set. And then you can email that to us, and we can we can work with you to get the the volumes updated for those 50 TMCs or however many TMCs there there might be. So good good suggestion, Jesse. Yeah, excellent suggestion. Yep. Uh, Jesse says, as all you, always, you are on top of it. What do you use when you don't have volume for those calculations? Well, when we don't have volumes, the, the, those TMCs are essentially left out. Okay. So that's, that's, where the, that's where the problem occurs, is it okay. starts to artificially deflate the, the user delay cost. Now, if, you're, if you only have a few TMCs missing, it's probably not that big a deal. But there are some roads and some places where, you know, there might be a substantial number of TMCs that, that are missing volume data. And even if you're not missing volume data, maybe the volume data you gave us is, you know, four or five years old at this point. And, you know, volumes change over time. We should, we should be updating those, I would think, at least annually. Sure. And I guess most people just give you HTMS volumes. 
Yeah, so we, we have a, a special format that we want it provided to us in. It's essentially, yeah, they're, they're, most people are taking AADTs from their HPMS submittals, and, and then we use that and apply that to, like a, a, to create a 15-minute volume profile uh, for the, the roadway. But we, we're really looking for you to give us the volumes per TMC segment. Hey, look at that. That's what the graph's supposed to look like. <laughs> so this is this is an actual graph of the national statistics for volume. So this this you know don't don't think that your state is missing you know 150 thousand uh, segments. That's not the case. But um, you know nationally, that's how many segments don't have volume data right now. And like you said, even if to, it's not that you don't have it, it's that if it's old, if it's five years old, well, you're not getting yes. credit for the current volume, which would then give you more user delay costs. Correct, correct. And hopefully a lot of these, um, a lot of these segments are, are non-interstate segments anyway, and most agencies are probably going to look at interstates and major freeways and arterials. A lot of these could be could be really small arterials that you're not doing analysis on anyway. Although I guess North Carolina, you all manage all of your roadways, so right. it doesn't apply to you all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. So Matt Glasser chimed in, and I know he wasn't, you know, using the new event query tool like I was while Michael was talking, but he said that it is very slick, and it is it is really slick. While we were talking, I took a screenshot and forwarded it to a coworker and said, okay, we can use this for a project that we're working on right now. So if you haven't checked it out, um, go to go to RITUS, look at in that data archive and pull up the um, event query tool. And it's, it's neat. You can see your own incidents mapped on a map. If you don't have a way to do that easily, this is a really easy way to do that. And as part of that tool, when it, whenever you filter anything in the uh, event in the event um, uh, table, the map then reflects what you've filtered. So you can, like, if you just want to see where all the vehicle fires are in your state, it'll map just those for you. Very cool. Very, oh, so that's I was I was wondering. Mine says showing 59 of 145, and it's because I've filtered on the data down to just crashes. So that's I see that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out, guys. Yep. It's pretty. It's a pretty slick tool. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, Simon writes: When will the final NPM RDS data be ready for download? Parentheses HPMS submissions this year. Uh, good question. I don't have an answer for you. I need to talk to the team. You know, we're waiting on a lot of conflation uh, to be finished up, and so and, until that's done, we can't really make those those permanently um, available for for download. Let me talk to the team, and in the email that we send out to everyone after after this meeting, I'll I'll have a date in there for you. Okay. Very good. Um, and also Sushant says, can we change the base map in trend map, for example, like a satellite view with labels? Well, that is a, a good feature request. That's not something we do today, but we will take note of that and see what it would take to, to get aerial photography and other, other types of uh, base maps on there. Is there anything other than satellite view that you'd be interested in? Or anyone else would be interested in. All right. While well, people are answering, how about terrain? Says James Lee. Okay. Satellite and terrain. We'll we'll look into all of these and see what could be done. Cool. And in the meantime, Justin answered that the final shape files should be ready by the fall, hopefully, and the data will be reprocessed for the new shape files after that. Cool. I assume that was from the NPM RDS question. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see Rich Taylor typing, so we'll wait a second. Hmm. 
So I asked you at the beginning to be thinking about, hey, I wish I could. Does anyone have any thoughts about, you know, they get into RITUS and you're doing an analysis and what happens to me is I go to a meeting and I present it and people, you know, you do all this great work and you're so excited and then they ask these, you know, spin-off questions and you're like, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> did you not notice the big great analysis we just did? But what are those things that people ask you for um, and how could we incorporate those features into RITUS? So Rich must have decided to, that maybe um, Justin answered the question sufficiently. I have a request to folks as well. Um, okay. We're getting more and more questions from people who are, are asking us how they can use RITIS to help um, prioritize and justify projects. So if we could get any agency that's using uh, using RITIS and the tools or the data as an input into their their programming and decision making um, process, whatever that may be for projects. Could you please let us know so that we can reach out to you? We, we'd like we'd like agencies to be able to share information on their their programming decision making process so they can try to learn from one another. And it, it might be worth even doing a special session on that. Uh, in the future. So Michael, when um, I think I asked you that question maybe six months ago and I got some good folks that wrote back to me and we wound up, you know, this is what we do here in North Carolina. We just figure it out on our own, right? But we, I, I will send you some of the people who told me they were doing it, but also we in the last six months have come up with a process to use data from VPP to prioritize capital projects. So I think um, I think we would be interest, willing to do a presentation on that maybe in a couple months. We, we finished the process, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the next round of projects after they've been selected, and we're going to run them through the tool. So we're not going to use it for this go-round, but we're going to mm -hmm. test out our methodology on the current round, and then in two years we'll, we'll use it on the future round if it goes well. But we'd be willing to uh, do a presentation on that if you'd like. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I think VDOT has a, a neat process as well. So they do. we'll try they to get do. several different agencies and maybe we'll have some different perspectives on that. Yeah. And you know, our funny thing was people said, um, oh, use reliability, use reliability. But what we wound up really using is more congestion and delay. And I think it's because we weren't quite ready. I, I, I kind of said, you know, you can't jump to re right to reliability. We haven't even talked about congestion. Now we're talking about reliability. So what we're really measuring is, is that first step. And I think once we get comfortable talking about congestion and delay, then we can add reliability to the mix. But it seems silly to talk about reliability when you haven't really talked about congestion. Sure. All right, Rich um, says, I was going to respond to Simon. The NPM RDS data for 2018 is, in fi is final in terms of su submission of the 2018 metric data via HPMS on June 15th, if that's what you were asking. And then Ed says, from Baltimore, we are working on a tool to overlay RITIS PDA data with our long-range plan CIP projects to monitor and evaluate what is going on and if projects are successful. Oh, that's wonderful. That's exciting. Very good. And then M. Dot is that Maryland DOT probably uh, mobility ro reports use RITIS to prioritize location. So there's some ideas for you, Michael. Cool. Yeah, I'll give another minute for people to chime in on how they're using it. All right, and while you're People are typing about that last call for any um, other thoughts on how you might want to make changes to RITIS or things you might want to see, ideas you have, ideas for um, presentations you'd like to see at future webinars, things that you've heard people doing that you'd like to know more about perhaps. Yeah, Matt says they use PDA to track bottlenecks every month, determine signal operation adjustments, and identify locations for capital operation improvement. Well, there you go. You have your suite of presenters right there. How easy was that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, not seeing any other typing, we'll go ahead. Um, 
And this is our wrap up. Um, if you have any questions, thank you all to our speakers today. They did a great job sharing their, their insights. And thank you for everyone who participated and advanced the state of practice in, in what we do here with this great data. Um, I know the question always comes up. I think the poor people at KMJ get 10 emails saying, can I have a copy, can I have a copy, can I have a copy? They will post the presentations on the website once they have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. They do a great job of posting um, the questions and the answers, and they do a really wonderful job. So just give them a little bit of time, and when they have it all posted on the website, they will send you an email saying, hey, this, this information has been posted on the website. So don't worry about that. It will come to you. You don't have to seek it out. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, here's the contacts for the Corridor Coalition and for PDA Suite, and um, anything about the logistics of the webinar can go to KMJ. So with that, let's see, did anyone else? Um, Justin says, and the recording will be posted. Oh, yes, there's an I-95 Corridor Coalition YouTube page now, and you can actually listen to the whole presentation um, from today's webinar if you want to on the file that you can find on the YouTube page. So with that, Justin, is there anything else we need to cover? That is it, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful Thursday. And we'll talk to you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.